I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, and my father wants me to thank you for telling me to tell him about the new way the American Weekly is being printed. Oh, has he seen it already? Mm-hmm. He looked at it the first thing this morning when he opened the paper. And what did he say? He said that you were right. It was everything you told me it was going to be. Oh, fine. Did he like the new color process? Yes, and so do I. The pictures are clearer and brighter and so colorful. That's what my father said. And what do you think? I think they're beautiful. And did your father find it more enjoyable to read? Yes. He said it was more pleasant to read because it was easier on his eyes, just like you said it would be. Well, I'm delighted to hear that. I was sure he'd like the change in the print and the paper as well as the colors. Well, he certainly did. And I know that everyone else will enjoy it as much as your father and you do. So be sure to tell all your friends. Oh, I will. I will. Now, could you please read the funny? Fuck the comic weekly. You bet. I'll read it right away. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. Hoppy in California were moving the furniture and other things for Buck Peters to the Wyoming ranch he had just bought. Just a short distance away from the ranch... Hoppy and his friends are attacked by strangers. They took safety in a cave. Their unknown assailants built a fire at the entrance of the cave to smoke Hoppy and his friends out. When they burst out of this cave, the strangers scattered and disappeared into the hills. Hoppy and the others had ridden on and found Buck Peter's new homestead. But instead of fine buildings and good grazing land, they find a deserted, run-down place with ramshackle buildings that look like they're ready to fall down. They stop in front of the ranch house. They see smoke drifting from the chimney. First picture, bottom row. Hello! Anybody home? But everything is silent. Hoppy says, no answer. Let's try the door. They go up to the door. The part is unlocked. So they go into the cabin. Lucky exclaims, why, the place is deserted. Hoppy says, hey, you and Mesquite search upstairs, Lucky. California. Check the bunkhouse and stable. I look around on this floor. The men quickly search the house. Hoppy sees some papers burning in the fireplace. Mesquite in California reports to Hoppy. Not a soul upstairs, Hoppy. Nor any place else. Hoppy, who is kneeling before the fireplace, third picture bottom row, answers. Well, this mess of papers didn't catch fire by themselves. Hoppy tries to get the papers out of the fire. Hanged if those charred edges don't look like legal documents. Last picture, as he holds a few pieces of them, he says, Why, they're destroyed property deeds. And all seem to be made out for the sale of this ranch. Oh, I bet I know what happened. I'll bet those same people who tried to shoot Hoppy and his friends have chased away Buck Peters and his family. Maybe they did. But there's something very strange about all this. Why should this ranch house look run down all of a sudden? Yes, that's strange, because Buck Peters said that it was a nice, shiny ranch with good buildings. Yes, there's something mysterious about this, very mysterious. Well, I know who's behind it. It's those two crooks that Hoppy caught when they were trying to steal the deed. Yes, I'm sure of that. And I'm sure we'll find out more about it next week. Now? Now can we turn over the page? Because I know we'll find some Valiant there. Very well, over the page we go. See? I was right. You were right. There's Prince Valiant on page three. Last week, you remember, Val's friends arrived home after their long journey to Rome. That's right. They brought the missionaries back with them. Missionaries who would bring the word of God to these wild northern people. And now, they're coming to baptize the two little twin babies. So please read quick. I'm anxious to see what they're going to call them. All right. We'll find out right away. Here we go to the baptism ceremony with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. 
Eckert, Breckert, Graham Alkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair print. <laughs> On the great day, a brilliant procession leaves the castle of Vikings' home and winds its way to the new church. All the noble warriors of Thule leave off fighting one another to attend the ceremony. But it's considered bad for the health to disobey the king's invitation. Last picture, top row. All who can find room and crowd into the church. But many of the Vikings prefer to stay outside, lest their warlike gods be offended. They don't trust this prince of peace who places love above anger. And then, big picture, middle of the page. They gather around the bishop with the long white hair and long white beard. All is silent as the bishop dips his hand to the holy water for the christening. Golden sunlight pours through the unfinished roof. Raw walls are covered with bright rugs and tapestries. The twins are delighted with the bishop's flowing white beard, and one of the babies secures a handful of it. They are given many names, but they will ever be known by those that Alita had promised. One for the graceful south, one for the robust north. They're named Valita and Karim. Good names for two little twin girls. Valida named after both Val and Alita and, and Karen. Those are nice names. I like them. So do I. And the two little babies seem to like them, too, because they look very happy. <laughs> yes, isn't that nice? <laughs> yes, it is. And maybe we'll find out more about the missionaries next week. Now let's turn over the page. Oh, look, there's Donald Duck on page five. Yes, Donald Duck, and I know what you want me to do. You're right, so please read quickly. Very well, here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze it, check it, Let's have music to fit a quack, quack. Today, Donald's nephew has come home from school. They come in the house where Donald is reading a book, and Dewey said, Gosh, our science teacher is smart. But Donald says, nothing. Second picture, Louie says, Hey, look, I mean, I mean, Mr. Tyler said, Time and space are the same thing. But Donald says, nothing. Third picture, Huey says, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says light travels faster than sound. And Donald says, nothing. <laughs> Dewey very angrily shouts fourth picture. He says all things fall toward the center of the earth. Donald says, less than nothing. And then a tricky gleam comes in Louie's eyes, and he whispers to Huey... <laughs> Huey nods his head and says, last picture, top row. Uh, uh, one more thing. He says, diamonds are just carbon after the proper heat and pressure. Donald pricks up his ears. And first picture, bottom row, Dewey screeches. And coal is carbon. Donald snaps. Okay, okay. So what? You kids go on out and play. The boys march to the door. As soon as they're gone, Donald leaps out of his chair. Dashes out the back way. Dashes to the garage and picks up a lump of coal, lights a torch, and with a bright smile on his face, last picture, puts heat and pressure on the lump of coal, sure that it will turn into a diamond. And Louie, and Huey, and Dewey peek in the door with a big smile on their faces, because they know Donald's pin feathers will turn gray before the coal turns into a diamond. <laughs> oh, those boys. They got even with Donald for not paying attention to them when they were talking about their lessons. <laughs> I'm afraid they did. <laughs> well, my father isn't like Donald, though. When I tell him what I learned in school, he talks about it with me, and then it makes it easier for me to remember it when I go back to school. That's a good idea. All fathers should do that. Yes, all fathers should do that. Mm -hmm. And since we're talking about science, I'm sure you'd like to see Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, please. Very well, let's turn over to the very last page of the first section. And there he is, 
mind? And you remember Flash and Dale were captured by the giants on the planet Rhea. And they were in a rocket ship. And Flash had just captured the Rian crew. And he's ordered the crew to take him back to the Earth. But I, I hope today we'll see Flash get home again, sir. Well, let's find out if he does. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega, rega, doon, doon, fasca, matash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Overcoming his giant guard by a judo trick, Flash seizes command of the Rian spaceship. Turning to the surprised pilot, he barks, full atom power ahead. And then moving to the control panel, Flash sets a course on an orbit that will take the ship to Earth. But the guard doesn't give up easily. Picking up a huge wrench, he hurls it at the control panel, short-circuiting the power. And last picture, top row, the crippled spaceship veers crazily in the bleak sky. his command post, the chief of the rocket fleet spots the erratic course of Flash's craft and orders his men to give chase. It's a pathetically unequal race. First picture bottom row, as the Rian Armada draws close, powerful magnet beams are trained on Flash's ship, holding it as if in a colossal vice. Flash tries to fire his guns. But the magnet beams have made them useless. He can only watch in despair as his ship is towed back to Rhea. Flash is brought before the king. Captain Rug of the Rian Giants pleads for the right to punish Flash himself, saying, He cast the spell of spotted sickness on my son, Sami. Then suddenly, Rube topples over. Last picture. <laughs> they see that his face is strangely blotched. The king leaps to his feet, and he cries, It is the fever! I'll destroy you myself, sorcerer! Heedless of his own danger for the moment, Flash stares gravely at Rube, another victim of a smallpox epidemic that may wipe out every rear. <laughs> That Flash is causing it by magic, don't they? Yes, that's why the king called Flash a sorcerer. Oh, and now the king is furious. And you think he'll order Flash executed? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. No, I can hardly wait. Well, to help you wait, let's pick up the second section of the Comic Weekly. Oh, look, there's Dagwood and Blondie. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramapho, Ramapham, Zim, Zam, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie and Mrs. Dithers have bought a set of dishes at an auction today. And first picture, second row, they're waiting for their husbands to come and carry the dishes home for them. Blondie says... Dagwood is very prompt. I'm sure they'll be here right away. <laughs> At this moment, Dagwood and Mr. Dithers are sitting at a soda fountain. Dithers is philosophizing about wives. Our wives are delicate little souls. They should be treasured and nurtured like precious little flowers. Dagwood answers. Yeah, you're right. We promised to cherish them when we married them. The men go out the door and they see they're next to a pool hall. This is too much of a temptation. So the men stop in to play a game of pool. Second picture, third row. About an hour later at the auction house, Blondie says to Mrs. Dithers, It doesn't look like they're coming. We'll have to carry the dishes ourselves. And they begin to stack the dishes in their arms. And Mrs. Dithers says, Wait I get my hands on that worm, Julius. <laughs> Picture third row. Dagwood looks at his watch. Hey, great Scott, look at the time. And Dithers remembers what they started out to do. Oh, our wives, our dear, our dear wives. They grab their coats and out the door they go. Down the street they dash. First picture, bottom row. Hurry, hurry. They turn the corner full speed and see two women carrying thousands of dishes in front of them. But it's too late to stop. And 
last picture. Mr. Jithers and Dagwood are sweeping up the mess off the sidewalk as two policemen stand behind them and two women lean against each other, waiting. Finally, one of the women speaks. It's Mrs. Jithers. When you get through with them, officer, turn them over to us. Yes. And Dagwood moans. <laughs> Be awfully unhappy about those dishes being broken. Yeah. And when a woman is unhappy about a thing like that, she never forgets. No. Well, now look, there's Roy Rogers. Oh, read that, please. Because you remember, Roy and his friend Chubby Waldron had found the girl who said she was looking for a job as a school teacher beside the water hole out there in the desert. And then, when Roy went to get her wagon, which was broken, he saw two men running away with it, and they said that they were just going to take it to town and report that it was lost. Yes, and then the three of them came back to the girl at the water hole with her suitcase. And just as Roy was holding it out to her... It opened up accidentally, and some burglar tools fell out. Let's see what she says to that. Yes, let's see what she says to that. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboy. hi yip hi -oh. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip hi -oh. When the girl sees the burglar tool, she pretends innocence and says she must have picked up the wrong bag at the depot. Her friend Doan says... Hey, this stuff that fell out of your suitcase looks like burglar tools to me, ma'am. And then he turns to Gaucho and says, Hey, Gaucho, find Nadine's valise and fetch it to Walden's place, will ya? Hey, listen, head straight for his ranch now and hide to dark. Who oh, see, see, Senor Derby? A little later, Roy and Chubby riding one horse and Doan and Miss Drake on the other arrive at Chubby's desert mansion. As they rein in last picture top row, they're greeted by a tall, husky ranch hand. Chubby says, Folks, this is Ten Penny Tompkins, my blacksmith. Ten Penny replies, Hey, Chubby, I just captured a stranger snooping around. I tied him up in the stable. Roy and Chubby dismount and go off to the stable to see who the stranger is. First picture bottom row, the girl dismounts, saying to Doan that she doesn't like the way things are turning out. Doan answers, Shut up, Nathane. It's your job to find where Walden hides his gold. I'll do the rest. <laughs> Roy and Chubby and Tenpenny come into the stable. Tenpenny explains, Hey, the poor cat escaped. I left him tied to the post. Roy sees the cut rope on the post, and at the foot, lying on the ground, Gaucho's weapon, the bola, the leather cord with the three weights on the end. Roy says, Hey, he cut away the rope but left his calling card. That bola. It was Gaucho, Derby Doan's sidekick. Doan walks in at this moment, and he says, Hey, come, come, Mr. Rogers. Don't be hasty. Gaucho isn't the only man who owns a boa. Roy answers last picture. Maybe not, Don, but we gotta find whoever it was. I'll search the hayloft upstairs. You look outside. Upstairs in the hayloft, crouches Gaucho, gun in hand. And he says to himself, Senor Rogers will take a bullet in the gizzard first. <laughs> Because Gaucho has a, a gun and he's hiding. Roy won't have a chance. Well, now, don't get too worried. Maybe Roy won't go up there right away. But now let's turn over the page. And look, there's Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Oh, don't waste a second. I just love Br'er Rabbit. So do I. So say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, Brer Rabbit always has more ways than one of doing two things at the same time. Brer Rabbit is busy loading some kegs in a wheelbarrow. Brer Barr looks around the fence and sees his five favorite letters written on the barrels. And these five letters spell... Honey. So Brer Barr exclaims, oh, Two kegs of honey. He comes up to Brer Rabbit and says, now Hold up, Brer Rabbit. You need some system." Brer Bar pushes Brer Rabbit away from the wheelbarrow, saying, uh, Let me help you with this, uh, uh, Lord. Brer Rabbit giggles to himself and follows behind Brer Rabbit, who pushes the wheelbarrow down the road. Up the hill and up the hill and up the hill they go. Brer Bar grunts first picture bottom rope. Uh, this here hill is uh, pushing back harder than I is pushing <laughs> Br'er Rabbit says, You was winning, Br'er uh, uh, uh. And over the top they go. 
In another minute, they're at Br'er Rabbit's house. Br'er Rabbit says, Yeah, you sure helped a lot, Rabbi. I'll just open up one of these kegs. Oh, yeah, I'll open it up. I can show you some of that messed up. Br'er Rabbit opens the keg and pours out nails. Br'er Bar goes, Duh, nails? No, uh, honey? Br'er Rabbit answers, Honey? Oh, you mean the kegs, Br'er Bar? Oh, shucks, I just borrowed them kegs to tote the nails in. Br'er Bar stalks off last picture. Die has been triggered. And Br'er Rabbit picks up a hammer and nail, says, Br'er Bar is all the time thinking about something what ain't. And Uncle Remus says, Don't push your luck too far up the wrong road. <laughs> oh, that was a good kick that Br'er Bar laid on Br'er Bar. Br'er Rabbit laid on Br'er Bar. He made him think he had honey in the cake. And it just turned out to be nails. And I'm sure no one eats nails, not even goats. Not even goats. Well, now I know you want to read Dick's Adventures, so let's go over to the very last page. Yes, I am Dick's adventures because Dick is in the American Navy in the early days of America. And he's on the ship Constitution, a famous American ship which had met up with six British ships. And, and when the wind died down on the ocean, there they were, one American ship facing the six British ships. But then the uh, captain of the, of the American ship had a good idea. He had his men get into small boats and tied ropes from the boats to the big ship, and they started to row and pull the ship away from the British. I wonder if they'll escape. Well, let's find out now. Here we go with Dick's adventures and say the magic words with me. Rickety pack, a zack, a zick. That's some music for adventurous Dick. The British captain sees the Yankee sailor slowly drawing the American ship away from him. He roars, second picture. Man the boats! More than one can play at this game! All day and all night, the race goes on. The British oarsmen, who are being whipped, trying to draw their ship close enough to the Americans to be within gun range. First picture, second row, at dawn, Dick sees the British ships gaining on them. He shouts to the American sailors, They're not stronger. They're afraid of the king's cat of nine tails if they slow up. So pull, men, pull! Late in the day, the wind springs up once more. There's a mad scramble back to the ships. Then, dodging, evading, using every trick in the book of navigation, the Constitution shakes off its pursuers, and that evening disappears in the covering darkness. Safe. The voice is calling. Hey, Dick, wake up, wake up, wake up! Last picture, Dick looks around and sees he's in the little sailboat on a lake near his home with his cousin Dan, who's saying, Hey, you've been fighting a whale of a battle in your sleep. Captain, they have his men whipped. Neither did I. But they don't do that anymore today. Oh, I'm glad of that because that's cruel. Yes, it is. Well, now look below Dick's adventure. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And at last they captured those crooks and Rusty and his friend Peter safe from those mean old men. Yes, you bet. And I think we'll start something new and interesting today. Yes, because Mr. Miles had a message from a man named Colorado Colby. Well, let's find out what this is all about. So here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and rusty. <laughs> they all head back to the farm today. Last picture, top row. And when they come into the house, they see a man waiting for Mr. Miles. Mr. Miles says, Oh, you're Mr. Colby, I presume. I apologize for being late. I was quite unavoidably detained. Colby replies, Oh, don't fret over that, Mr. Miles. A few minutes more or less ain't going to make no difference to me. Glad to meet up with you. First picture, bottom row, they sit down, and Mr. Colby says, Well, now, uh, I'll get right down to cases, gents. I'm a dealer in riding horses. I sell them to dude ranchers, riding schools, carnivals, circuses, and the movies. But to sell them, I first have to buy them, right? Uh, yes, yes, of course. So I understand from your letters. Of course, uh, out of all the horses we breed, Mr. Colby, we keep only a few for training. The others we send to the yearling sales. Sure, oh, sure, of course. But I save you a lot of time, Mr. Miles. A lot of headaches, too, by taking them all off your hands at one crack. Now, what do you say? Well, uh, suppose you call this evening, Mr. Colby. I'll consider it and give you my answer then. Several hours later, Mr. Miles and Tex are out in the paddock looking at some of the horses. Tex, 
I've just about decided to sell some horses to Kobe, but I want to know just what happened to them. So I'm going to send you and the boys along with them. Oh, good, boss. Your deal seems to be on the up and up, but uh, you never know. Meanwhile, last picture, on a farm near the seacoast, two men are talking. One, a man wearing the yachting cap, is shaking his head, saying, I don't know, Blackie. I get to admit it's a slick setup, but uh, ain't it risky? How about your partner, Colby, uh, uh, Colorado Colby, you know? He, he ain't in on this, is he? The man named Blackie answers, Why, of course Colby isn't in on it. That's my aunt don't say. Up to now, you and I are the only ones in on it. So what do you say, Captain? something is a slick setup and asks if it's risky. I don't think he's up to anything else but up to bad business. And I think you're right. And, but the man named Blackie says that Colorado is mean on it. I wonder, wonder what that means. Well, maybe we'll find the answer to that next week. I think we're beginning a new adventure that'll mean excitement for everyone. And now don't forget about the colorful new American Weekly available at all newsstands. You'll certainly want to see that. And now that's all the time I have today. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.